Salads are great for watching your weight. However, a salad dressing that is loaded with calories can put those extra pounds right back on. Instead, use delicious new Frenchette dressing for salads. Because new Frenchette has only 7 calories per teaspoon, but a bottle full of fresh homemade flavor. Yes, while regular oily dressings are loaded with calories, which can add pounds, New Frenchette has trimmed calories down to only seven per teaspoon. So remember, a regular dressing that is loaded with calories can put the pounds right back on you. But not when you use delicious new Frenchette, because new Frenchette has only seven calories per teaspoon, but a bottle full of fresh homemade flavor. And if you prefer the extra spicy tang of an Italian dressing, try new Frenchette Italian style. Buy them both. New Frenchette and new Frenchette Italian style. Jane Fonda decided in 1958 to follow the well-known path trod by her distinguished father, actor Henry Fonda. Jane worked as a photographer's model to earn a living while she mastered the art well enough to act in summer stock. Then she went to Hollywood to appear in Tall Story. She returned to Broadway in There Was a Little Girl and Invitation to a March. Today, in her very early 20s, Miss Fonda is already an established star. When we visited Jane Fonda some time ago, she was in the midst of decorating a new apartment in this building in New York City. It's in Midtown, only about three blocks from the most famous theatrical street in the world, Broadway. Hello, Jane. Hello, Charlie. I think that we caught you just moving into this apartment. You certainly did. It's very funny. Every time I watch your show, there's always a lovely house and, and marvelous antiques and furniture. And look what we have. Well, I don't think it's that <laughs> bad. What room is this? This is the bedroom, or it will be. And uh, how are you going to do it? Well, it's going to be very crazy. It's going to have uh, wall-to-wall carpet, bright orange. And over here, there's going to be a, a great big brass bed, which I found, with a canopy that goes way up like this and it swoops around and is attached to the ceiling with a crown and, and has, you know, material draped on it and I'm going to have the material and the curtains and the wallpaper are all going to be print, orange and, and very busy with the orange rug and it's all going to have a very kind of closing in feeling. Well, I it's find something it I've hard... always wanted to do and I figure this is the last chance I'm going to get to do an apartment where nobody else has anything to say about it. Well, like most men, I'm not very good at visualizing these things. But I saw uh, that you've already made a start, that you've okay. got a sunflower and a lion and an unidentifiable object of some kind already. I know, well, the there. furniture doesn't come in yet, but, but all my, my little animals do. You know, these are all presents that were given to me opening night of, of my play, There Was a Little Girl. This, the, the producers gave me this because in the play I wore sunglasses and, and green pants. And my roommate gave me this. It's fabulous. Is it alive? Is this a marvelous opening night present? It's not real. And, and this is a... <laughs> this is, the name of the play was There Was a Little Girl, you know, that had a little curl right in the middle of her forehead. So this is her horrid thing, and, and that's when she's good. You no. pull the dress up. And she's very good. <laughs> and, and the lion. What about the lion? The lion, this is another gift from the producers, because they used to call me their lion. Why, why did they call you their lion? I don't know, because I was brave, I guess. My first show and everything. Janie, is this the first apartment that you've had of your very own in New York? Well, it's the first apartment I've had by myself, yes. I've, I've been living in an apartment with a roommate. But this is a lot different because I can put all the things that I want to here. Do you think it's well, You said you can't visualize it, neither can I. I haven't any idea what this room is going to look like when I'm finished. It's going to be mad. Jane, do you think it's important for a girl starting out in the theater to be on her own, to have her own apartment like this? Well, I think uh, it helps, I think, to be away from the family, particularly for me. You know, if, if, if a child and the parent work in the same business, it's, uh, you feel more independent. You know, I, I feel... I don't have to always be explaining what I'm doing and everything like that. I want to talk about uh, I hope your... my father's not listening to this. He probably is. I want, to, I want to talk about your acting in a minute, but show us some more of the apartment. Okay. Come into my boudoir. This is, this is my little dressing room, which I'm fixing up to do my 
My ballet bar in. You it's study that... ballet, huh? Yes, I do, and I'm going to have mirrors from the ceiling to the floor and white vinyl floor on it, and I'm, I, I put my ballet bar right along there, and this is where I do my, my exercises all day long in this tiny little space here. What else do you study, Jane? Well, I study singing and, and acting with Lee Strasberg. Uh-huh. And jazz dancing. Well, I should think you've got your hands full, even though uh, oh, you, I love it. you aren't in a play. I just love it. I just finished three hours of dancing. What else is there in the apartment? I'll show you my living room. And this is the living room, <laughs> which looks a little bit like a set for our town, doesn't it? Well, it's a good room to begin with. What is, what's it going to look like when you're finished? Your guess is as good as mine. I have the vaguest idea. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have the floor stained black, and my furniture comes in tomorrow, which consists of one couch and about five chairs. And I don't know. I'm just going to live in it for a while and see, you know, what I want to do. My books will go in there, and I'll put another bookcase over there, hang some things on the mirror and build a fire, and that's it. <laughs> I see you've got some pictures for the walls. Is that, is that a picture of you as a blonde there on the mantel? That's me when I was young, yes. How old? I don't know, about two, I guess. I don't know. It looks like me just a minute ago holding that doll, doesn't it? Well, you were an awfully pretty girl then. And uh, there's a friend of mine. Yeah. And another picture of me when I was little and my mother and my little brother Peter, who is also an actor. It runs in the family. It certainly does, and he's good. Wow. And uh, <laughs> look at that face. These are some pictures that were taken when Dad was watching uh, a love scene that was being shot for Tall Story, and he didn't know he was being photographed. I would say those are pictures of a man who is very proud of his daughter's acting. I think he looks a little dubious. <laughs> And let me see what else. They're going to bring shades in tomorrow, so I'll have some privacy. And I've set up my little table here to eat on. I, li I like one little, one place that's set up. Makes me feel like I've moved in already. Well, it looks very pretty. Are you a good cook, Jane? I should Jane? have lit the candles. Am I a good cook? Yeah. Well, I think so. I've, I've done my own cooking for a long time. Several friends have gotten sick, but not too many. I'll show you the kitchen. That's it. Big enough. Jane, you said a minute ago that you're studying acting with Lee Strasberg. Now, isn't he the one who's the exponent of the method? That's right. Um, it's funny, when anybody hears, hears the word method, they always, you know, they think right away of Brando and uh, picking the fingers and the whole thing. I know they do. But I, I've been with him for about two years, and it's, he's just brilliant. It's the most marvelous... Uh, you know, when my father started acting, it wasn't... He never had to study, because in those days, there weren't as many people. There weren't as many actors. There weren't as many people competing for parts. And they got their experience by, um, by just working. You know, they got much more of an opportunity to work. Mm -hmm. And they didn't have to study. But when we go up for a reading, you know, we have to be practically professionals when, when we go up for our first reading. And so it's, it's I think, more important for us to study you know, this generation. And I've been with him, uh, with uh, Lee Strasberg for about two years. And uh, it's so funny because I tried to, I, I, I talked to Dad about the method and about the way I work. And he just says, be quiet. I don't want to hear about it. Just just do it. And, you know, he's right. It doesn't matter how you do it. It's how it comes out. But he, he, he doesn't talk about the way he works because he, uh, he hasn't learned it in that way. And it, I think it kind of scares him when I start throwing terms at him. So I watch him, and I talk to my friends, and I don't try to explain to him. But the method is really an a, a way of approaching a part, of, of bringing yourself into a part, you know? Well, now, Jane, as you yourself mentioned uh, a minute ago when you started talking about the method, a lot of method actors do seem mannered or to have a number of mannerisms, uh, don't you ever worry about picking up that sort of thing yourself? Well, uh, no, because the method itself doesn't bring mannerisms with it. I mean, like, uh, like in any, like, 
like uh, in your profession, you know, there are good ones and there are bad ones. And, uh, or like take a cameraman where there is a, a technical thing they have to learn. But some of them are good and some of them are bad. And the good ones don't necessarily pick up the bad habits of the bad ones. And uh, you just, you use it to your own advantage as well as you can. And I, I think because it's a way of, of, of playing a part realistically and avoiding cliches, you know, and, and trying to, to, to be believable on the stage, um, I think that people get it confused with naturalism, which is, you know, standing around and the whole thing. But it's, it's, it's not that at all. Well, now, you, you were talking about your father as a non-method actor. And when I was looking at those pictures of him when he was on the set and watching you, I couldn't help but feeling what a very distinct and recognizable personality Henry Fonda is in all his roles. Yeah. Now, what is more important to an actor? Personality like that or the kind of training that you're talking about? Well, I, th I think they're both the same. I mean, I think they, they, uh, they're complementary. They go together because you... A technique is using your quality to fit into whatever part you're doing. Jane, and in your short career already, you've done both theater and motion pictures. Which yeah. do you find the most rewarding? Well, I like the theater at this stage of my development. I've only done one of each, so it's hard to say. No, I like everything, really, and I've, I'd love someday to be able to do that. That's why I study singing and dancing, because I'd like to do a musical uh -huh. on film or on the stage. But because I am just beginning... I, I feel that the place to, to learn the craft is on the stage, which is why I've stayed in New York and why I, you know, I'm working on the stage more. One more big question now, a big broad question, Jane. Right now, at the threshold of your career, what is the most important thing in life to you? That's a big <laughs> There's so many things. I, I guess my... My work right now is the most important thing. My work and, and, uh, and getting better and enjoying doing it, you know, because the funny thing is that I can sit in this room or at that table there and I can imagine uh, playing a part that I've wanted to do a long time. And it'll be marvelous, but, but when you actually get to doing it, sometimes you don't always enjoy it. You know, there gets a lot of pain starts coming in, inside kind of pain. And I'd like to be able to work well and... and and enjoy it while I'm doing it. Well, you've made an awfully good no start. Name. Jane, thank you for letting us come and see you tonight. Thank you. And right. I hope that you let me come back again when the you apartment is finished. You have to come back when it's furnished. And I see it all the way you mean it to be. Good night. Good night, and thank you. I'll be back in a moment right after this message. Newport filters cigarettes. Newport menthol cigarettes. A hint of mint makes a difference. So fresh that you'll know the difference. They're soft, smoking with cool menthol. It's so refreshing while you're smoking Newport filters cigarettes. While you're smoking a Newport, just remember this hint. You get the coolness of menthol and the freshness of mint with the best of tobaccos and a flavor that's bright. When you're smoking a Newport, then your smoking is right. Are there any questions, man? It's so refreshing while you're smoking Newport filter cigarettes. Newport filter cigarettes. Newport filter He's a gentle man with a gentle touch And there's really no one quite as much Completely from rabbit of a guy He's got more sun than a sunny day
because it creates earthquakes which weaken the foundations of the dikes and cause very deep fissures. This is one of the reasons why I believe it is systematic and purposeful, the bombing of the dikes, because of the manner in which the dikes are being bombed. The, bo the dikes are being cut in two and they are also being bombed on both <coughs> sides. There are also delayed reaction perforation bombs going into the dikes laterally and lodging themselves under the base of the dikes. Why else do I think that these dikes are being bombed on purpose? The timing. The first dikes that were bombed were the coastal dikes and it, the typhoon season comes before the, uh, the monsoon season. And this is extremely serious. All of the coastal dikes in the area between, between the 19th and the 21st parallel have been hit systematically. When the water, when the seawater comes in, the salt of the seawater will destroy the land and the delta forever, perhaps. You cannot grow rice when there's too a too heavy salt content. Not only are the dikes being bombed, the dams are being bombed, the hydraulic systems are being bombed, the sluices are being bombed, and the pumping stations are being bombed. On July, on June 14th, on the Ma River, in the Tan Hua province, the people who were repairing the dike there, after it was bombed three successive times, were bombed with anti-personnel weapons. I spoke to a woman who was there and saw it happen. And she described they were very young students, medical students, and children, mainly women, who came to repair the dikes and were by the hundreds have it taken to the hospital many killed arms and legs blown off she also said that a, a few days later at four o'clock in the morning u.s planes came and dropped leaflets the leaflets said the united states loves the vietnamese people other leaflets said the united states wants peace that was at four o'clock in the morning at seven o'clock in the morning the planes came back and she reported that they dropped bombs this time, anti-personnel bombs, again, <coughs> killing and injuring many people. A few hours long will not be able, their spirit will not be able to be broken no matter how many bombs Richard Nixon orders dropped on their country. The preparations that have been made in the event of, of the flooding are extraordinary. Everyone has a boat. There have been already projects and research into what would happen if the flooding comes, what kind of plants can grow underwater, can the rice be planted on the side of the hills which are now on a middle level, for example. They have found over the years ingenious and inventive ways of surviving despite the bombing. And my feeling is that for the people of the North, every bomb that drops on them is a sign that Nixon is being defeated in the South. They know that in 1965, Johnson began to bomb the North when the special war in the South was failing. They know what is happening in the Mekong Delta. They know what is happening in Quang Tri and in so many of the areas in the Central Plains and Highlands. And they believe that it is a matter of time. They, are, they seem to be extremely determined. And I think that the reason for this, there are many, many reasons. One of them is because I think that when it comes to national independence and freedom, you don't compromise. The Americans didn't in the beginning of our own country, and the Vietnamese have been fighting for 4,000 years this two-pronged fight against nature on the one hand and invading armies on the other hand, and they have never compromised. And Nixon's offers for ceasefire they may sound good to us who are so far away from Vietnam, but for the Vietnamese peasants laying down their arms, giving up, surrendering, compromising on anything short of complete freedom and independence, 
compromising when it comes to accepting a government in Saigon that it is not of their choice, I don't believe that they will. I don't believe that any big power manipulation on the part of Russia or China, as well as the United States, is going to make these people do anything but fight until they achieve freedom. And I think it is very sad. I think the day will come when the people in the United States will understand, all of us, why the Vietnamese are fighting and will, for reasons that I don't understand, I don't know whether it was for political reasons or not, it is a rough <coughs> putting together of pieces of film. It's not been cut, it's not been shortened, so it's, it's a little bit perhaps tedious, I, I, I don't know. You'll have to, you'll have to, uh, it's about 25 minutes, I believe. Let me just, let me just, uh, um, is not because I need to have a film of myself in Vietnam, but because we were afraid that people would feel that it was a propaganda film made by the Vietnamese if it was not apparent that, that I was there. The reason that I am wearing Vietnamese clothes is because the heat is beyond belief. One is bathed in sweat, and the only the clothes that I have are blue jeans, and they are extremely uncomfortable. So as a traveler, as most travelers, when you go to a foreign country, you, you do what the natives do, you wear. I did what the Vietnamese did, I wore their clothes, and a lot of people seem to feel that this is strange. I think that it's only natural that one would wear the most comfortable clothes possible. Everyone has to wear helmets, or carry helmets, although after a while, I guess you, you sort of get a lax about that because there is always, in the northern point where he's pointing to, is the most vulnerable and strategic point in the dike system because it is there where five rivers converge. In other words, in the seasons of floods, the dike in that portion has to hold back the waters not only of the Taiban River, but of five other rivers which flow down from the mountains. This is a, a portion of the dike section on the Kintai River. Since May 10th, there were eight raids against hey. Hey. seven prisoners, whose names I will give you in a moment. <laughs> Kenneth James Fraser, James Philip Paget, David Wellesley Hoffman. I'll give it to you again later. Edison Wainwright Miller. I I'll give them to anybody that wants them later. William Glenn Burns, Edward K. Elias, and Walter Eugene Wilbur. First of all, what is happening in the United States with about the peace movement? We are very worried that Nixon will stay in office because we think if he does, we are going to stay in here for God knows how long. He's emotional. He said, I'm reading a book called The Draft, written by the American okay. Friends Service Committee, The Draft. He said, I've, I was in the service for 16 years, and for the first time in my life, I understand what happened to me. He said, I had completely forgotten that there was anything outside of the military. Military had become my whole life. He said, I was a robot. And he said, I'm so afraid that this is happening to other people. The film I can't. Yeah, yeah. I can't wait. For that. And I knew no other way of communicating with the pilots. I have tried to get into South Vietnam, and I have been refused. I have tried to get to Thailand, and I've been refused. I'm not allowed on military bases. I have tried in every way I can to communicate with the soldiers. Prisoners said to me, confirmed it. They said that they are told that they are bombing military targets. They said, he said that they're told that they're bombing to save the prisoners that are, that are in prison there. And the, the, the prisoners laughed because, of course, the bombs are endangering their lives. I have complete belief, and, I, it, was, and it was proven true when I met these, these seven men who had been pilots and who have recognized what they, what, what they did. I spoke as an American citizen. I spoke as a concerned American woman. And I said, please, consider what you're doing. I know how hard it is when you've been through military training and you're told, and it's so remote, you're flying way up in the sky. You can't see what it is you're bombing. 
You don't, you don't see the faces of the people. You're just pushing buttons. But as someone who is on the ground, uh, this is what I want to communicate, and this is what I said. I would no more tell the soldiers to defect and to go over and fight with the Vietnamese. I mean, it, it's absurd. They are needed at home. I think we have our, enough problems at home. I suggested to them that maybe they come home and deal with the problems that we have here. I think that the enemy is not way across the sea in some land where people have, have never set foot on our country. The enemy is here within our own country. The Vietnamese don't need American pilots. The Vietnamese don't need American soldiers to fight with them. They're doing just fine. The they're fighting, they're fighting for their freedom. And I think that if the American soldiers and pilots knew it, they would stop. I have the text of what I said. Wait a minute, please. I have the text of my of my speech here, and if anybody wants more, it can be Xeroxed. After the, now after I will the, take questions. Ms. Ronda, don't you, do you believe that you are part uh, of a massive uh, North Vietnamese propaganda uh, because you met with those prisoners, uh, because um, they said that they were for America, withdrawing from Vietnam? Don't you believe that although you want to go there and show up the bad conditions there that uh, in all on a bigger scale that North Vietnamese is very happy about what you're doing and they're actually there and using you. Uh, who, where are you? What is your name and where are you from? John Bush and WPAD. WPAD. Um, do you think that they blow up their own buildings and bomb their own dikes? Uh, do you think they slaughter their own people to sort of uh, touch uh, American public opinion? Are the women that I saw mutilated in the most horrible way, uh, mutilated by the Vietnamese in order to move Americans? They're in their interest. Their interests are to end the war and be left alone. The American, the interest of the American people is to leave the Vietnamese people alone. It is in our interests. Anybody that is speaking out against the war is carrying on a propaganda, a propaganda for peace, a propaganda for life and against death. Miss Fonda, you said that, that. And I think that no one, no American citizen should accept anybody else's definition of who the enemy is. It is an undeclared war. I have no reason to feel that the Vietnamese people are my enemy. They have done me no harm. They have done me no harm. I will fight and I will give my life to defend this country from people that I consider my that I consider our enemies. The Vietnamese people have I I truly believe do not want to humiliate this country, don't want to don't want to attack us. They just want to be left alone. Ms. Fonda, you said that the use of bombs by B-52 is imprecise. Wait. You were quoted as supporting Senator McGovern on Hanoi Radio. Did you, in fact, support Senator McGovern on Hanoi Radio? And if so, do you think it's better? Where are you from and what's your name? Channel 11, all blue. Um, no, I, I never gave a, a, a statement in, in support of McGovern. I don't campaign for anybody. I am campaigning for peace and I'm talking about Vietnam. I think that Richard Nixon is trying to put Vietnam in the back pages. I think he's trying to make it uh, a secondary issue by fooling people into thinking that he's ending the war. And I think that it is a most monstrous lie, a monstrous lie. It is unimaginable the, w the degree to which a man who is the head of this country is lying to the American people. and. That's what I'm talking about. I am not taking a stand or campaigning for anyone. Ms. Fonda. I am trying to end the war. Okay, wait, wait, wait. We have one question at a time. We'll get to everybody. You said that the use of bombs by B-52s, the dropping of bombs by B-52s, is an imprecise technique. <coughs> and if, if this is true, why do you feel that the bombing of the dikes and the bombing of hospitals that you saw could not be accidental? The, um, first of all, the dikes are not being bombed yet by B-52s. Uh, they're, they're being bombed by Phantom, Phantom Jets, F-4. The bombing of cities by B-52s means that orders are being given to wipe out a city. You can't, you can't carry on carpet bombings, which means three planes flying in a particular formation miles up in the sky and dropping bomb after bomb after bomb. And I saw films of what it's like for a B-52, and I met people who had been under those bombs. And it means that you are trying to raise a city. Now, 
again, it goes back to the, you know, what you, you, to destroy a city to save it from what? You know, destroy, who are we trying to help there? You know what I mean? Then is it, then is it the, the scale of the bombing that is wrong, or is it the selection of deliberate <laughs> targets, cities, I or is it the, the selection of hospital sites? What, just, what are you charging the government with doing? I'm charging the government with genocide, with genocide. And, right. and, and ecticide and biocide. Uh, which means that we are also destroying their land and their crops, and and it one and it looks like we are also carrying out meteorological um, warfare against them. Okay. Just, 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 just one, just one second. Um, the fundamental issue is, however, that we should be bombing nothing. That the argument that well, there's a military target is does not hold up. We are not allowed legally in any way to be bombing Vietnam and North Vietnam. The Geneva Accords specifically says that it is a, an independent sovereign territory. We have no right to be bombing anything in North Vietnam. Nothing. Wait, wait, right there. Yesterday, no, no, hang on down there. there. Wait, 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 uh, was there any indication by the people in Hanoi that they, since these prisoners seem to uh, be willing to tell their story in the States, they would release these prisoners uh, with no precondition? We're destroying their country. We're slaughtering their people by the tens of thousands. <clears throat> Why should they do something that is, that is unheard of? In the, I mean, warfare is warfare. If, they're being if we were being attacked, we would not release the prisoners of the people who were coming and raping our women and burning our houses and destroying our country, release their prisoners like that. The war will be over. And when the war is over, the prisoners will be released. And I hope that we will help them rebuild their country. Did they assure okay, you wait, that? Right here. Right here. Ms. Fonda. Did they assure you Oh, that? they certainly did. You know what they said to me? They said, have you any idea what it means for us to have to keep these pilots here? You know, the Vietnamese live on very little. They, they live very simply. Pilots, for, for a Vietnamese to give a pilot a turkey means an enormous sacrifice for people who are eating a handful of rice, for a people who are, who are, who are pulling in their belts and will continue to do so, you know? It is, it is not in their interests to have to hang, to keep these pilots. It is amazing, I will have to say, when you're under the American bombs and when you've seen the destruction, it is amazing to me that they not only don't kill the pilots when the peasants, when the, the, the pilots will fall into a field, half of the families there have been wiped out, and the peasants don't kill the pilot, don't injure him, but very often risk their lives in bringing him back to be treated medically. And the pilots expressed amazement at this, you know. So we mustn't forget this. We must always think of the issue of pilots in relation to what we are doing to their country. Why don't they allow the Red Cross in to, to see these prisoners? Look, Let's have them in Geneva the first that thing that has to happen is the war has to end. Well, Once the war ends, why those why pilots will be home. Why, why, why should they use the prisoners as pawns? They're such nice people, as you say. Uh, they are nice people. They are nice people. The, they have learned, unfortunately, through terrible experience, that they had better keep to themselves where those pilots are and who they are, because they are afraid that the lives of the pilots are going to be endangered again if Richard Nixon stages another Sante-type raid, you know. They, all evidence proves to the fact that the pilots are being well taken care of. <coughs> I didn't see them all, but I don't think that these men were brainwashed. I think they're being well treated. When the war is over, they will be released. Most Americans right think that you are brainwashed, Ms. Swamp. Yes, I'd like to... I'm, I'm sure you've seen the emotional reaction to your trip. Uh, you... You were quoted as saying that uh, you thought that the uh, North Vietnamese would triumph over the Americans. This was a quote from Hanoi. Do you believe this? One has only to study Vietnamese history to see that it is not bombs or any threats on the part of Mr. Nixon that is going to force the Vietnamese from the northern part of the country or the southern part of the country to lay down 
their, their arms and surrender when the independence and freedom and democracy of their country is at stake. Could you tell us about the uh, civilian damage that you saw, the dikes and well, stuff? So I, I, I don't want to do it superficially. It was very severe. It is a very serious problem. It is, to my, in my opinion, very deliberate. I want to go into it in detail, and I will do so on Tuesday with film and with, with photographs. You have proof, in other words. Yes, I do. Yes, I do. Uh, you, you were also quoted as um, uh, advising American personnel in South Vietnam to disobey orders. Is this true? <laughs> I'll, I'll talk about that on Tuesday, too. <laughs> and I think a congressman said that the Justice Department should look into this. Uh, the Justice Department should look into what Mr. Nixon is doing is doing. There is a very serious betrayal. There's a very serious traitor in our midst, and I think it's Richard Nixon. First of all, I, I, uh, it was an unusual meeting because uh, there was filming, television, television filmed the beginning and the end. Huh? Il est là depuis 67, il y a d'autres qui sont là depuis un mois. Some of this man was there since 1967, others have been there since a month. Um, they assured me that they were in good health. They told me to tell their families that they, are, that they are being well taken care of. When I asked them if they were brainwashed, they all laughed. <laughs> they, uh, to all indications, they are fine. They have eaten, uh, they are eating properly. They are eating much better than the Vietnamese. Without exception, they expressed shame about what they'd done. They said, they said to me, they, they all wanted to know about what was going on in the United States. And they all expressed concern that Richard Nixon, that if Richard Nixon remains in office, they fear that they will remain in prison forever, perhaps. And they all, at the end, as the, uh, as, as at the end of, we, we were together about 50 minutes talking very informally. They were, they were saying, call this one and call that one. And on the corner of Anaheim and Orange, there's a woman in the, in, in the city center supermarket and my daughter in this place. And they were giving me all these names of people. And they said, call them up and tell them to work. Tell them to work in the peace movement. Tell them to work for McGovern. Tell them to, that we've got to get Nixon out of office. Now. Bon, je, je... Yeah, okay. I, I want to, uh, I want to, uh, I, I think... No, I... Okay, I'm not finished with my statement yet. Yes, I, I'm going to I'm going to repeat for the for the purpose of the Americans who are here what I said in the beginning. <clears throat> I was in Vietnam for in, in uh, the North Vietnam for two weeks. I was the guest of the Committee of Solidarity with the American people and with the uh, 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 Cinema Association of uh, the Democratic Republic of Vietnam. <clears throat> I went for three reasons. First of all, because I wanted to see with my own eyes whether or not civilian targets were being bombed. Secondly, I wanted to see what the morale was like in North Vietnam. And if the morale was not, as is reported in the United States, that is to say, collapsing, I wanted to try to understand why. Could you give us your conclusion? I'd like to just speak about the dikes for, uh, for a minute. Like almost everything else in Vietnam, in order to understand the importance of the dikes, you have to go back thousands of years. And I, I, I think it's important to do that, just, just for, for a minute. The nation of Vietnam was one back from the sea, inch by inch and yard by yard, 4,000 years ago by the building of these dikes. It's, uh, it's at the very core of the Vietnamese nation. The necessity to mobilize millions of people in the building and rebuilding and reinforcing of these dikes, it, was, it became necessary to create a centralized system, a social system, a, a government, if you like. And these dikes have a great deal to do with 
with the with the national identity of Vietnam. A, a well-known writer, Nguyen Dinh Thi, said to me, you can see we don't have big palaces, we don't, big, we don't build big houses. Our monuments are not particularly large, although they're beautiful. What we have that is big in Vietnam are our dikes. And he talked about how I met historians, I met scientists, archaeologists, I met writers, I met, I met soldiers, workers, peasants. Everybody talks about the dikes with with pride. It is, um, it is something that means a lot. And you can, when you see the land, you understand why. It's an agricultural society. And in understanding that, you can begin to understand why the dikes are being bombed. And I believe in my heart <coughs> profoundly that the dikes are being bombed on purpose. It is very difficult when you see kilometer after kilometer of flat rice field with nothing else with no convoys, with no military material. And suddenly, as I said before, right at the most crucial points of the dike system, this accumulation of bomb craters, to think that it is anything but, but on purpose, especially given the fact that you hear every day in the United States the boasts about the accuracy of our new weapons, the laser bombs, the smart bombs, and so on and so forth. When you see the villages and the cities that have been bombed, and when you talk to the people, and when you experience what life is like in Hanoi, you understand that the bombing is not having the effect that I think Richard Nixon would like it to have. It is far from destroying the spirit of the people. It is bringing them together. It's, it's unifying the people. It's making them clearer than their essence. The question of military targets, I think, I don't think that the Vietnamese would be foolish enough to put uh, anything, uh, military strategic uh, equipment, convoys, anything else on top of their dikes. It's very hard, as I said before, to get there, to get to the dikes, because of the mud, because of the rice, the rice lands. But even so, we have no right to bomb military targets in Vietnam. We have no right to attack that country. This is, this is the fundamental point that people have to keep in mind. The Vietnamese people have never set foot in our land. They have never threatened our security. They, they are fighting as the American people did for freedom and independence. And of course they will defend their country. You, you walk in the streets of Hanoi. It's not a rich city, of course not. And the people have had to put in their belts, pu pull in their belts a little bit. Uh, uh, because of the situation. But the people are happy. I have been in practically every country in the world, and I have never seen what I saw in Vietnam. People holding hands, people helping each other, people caring about each other. I didn't see anybody hitting anybody, yelling at anybody. There's this spirit, ça entraide, les gens s'entraide, they help each other. It's an incredible, um, gentle, human, kind of society, what I saw of it. Uh, and you think, I tried to flash back to such a short time ago, where they were servants to the French, where they were coolies, where they were serfs, where the land didn't belong to them. When this team is going to have to recognize the fact that it is a people's war, the people are fighting for their freedom, they are demanding independence and democracy. Independence and democracy will not come by the United States imposing a government in Saigon. You can't separate the military from the political. Freedom and independence, for them to lay down their arms, is surrender. And if there's anything I learned in Vietnam, it's after 4,000 years of struggle against nature and against all kinds of very powerful and professional armies, they will not surrender now. They never have in their past, and they are certainly not going to surrender now. And Richard Nixon's eight-point plan of, in, of May 8th is asking the peasants and the people who are on the verge of controlling their own lives for the first time in so long to lay down their arms and compromise, and I do not believe they will do it. And I think that Richard Nixon is going to have to study Vietnamese history, read Vietnamese poetry, he and the Russians and the Chinese, because I think that any big powers that are trying to manipulate Vietnam 
and trying to coerce Vietnam into taking any position that falls short of freedom and independence, they're making a grave mistake. Yeah? Uh, they, what they said was, um, in one way or another, what do you think the chances of Nixon being ousted are? They were very concerned that if Nixon remains president, they will remain in prison. They all, in one way or another, expressed their concern about that and were, and were very desirous of their families to become involved in the peace movement and work to get Nixon out of office. Oui. Les, uh, moi, moi je dois dire, uh, I'm going to say something first. And I think it's interesting that while American bombs are killing Vietnamese people, destroying Vietnamese cities, the B-52 strategic bombers bombing, I will in a minute, bombing civilians, it's like trying to kill a butterfly with a machine gun. People are concerned about the pilots. What I can't understand, I, I, it amazes me when you are under American bombs and your life is threatened by American bombs and your families have been killed by American bombs as these peasants' families have. The fact that they rescue the American pilots and that these pilots are well treated and cared for and operated on, I find miraculous. And I think that it is an indication of the quality of human beings that there are in Vietnam. Bon, j'ai dit que les pilotes, propres, pour ses propres intérêts, et ils m'ont dit de trans... Uh, just a moment, please. Yes. The, the question is with regarding, regarding the accusation uh, against me that of, of treason. Um, I'm having a press conference in New York on Friday, Friday morning at 10 o'clock at the Drake Hotel, where I will go into detail about that. Longer. There, there. I spoke every day on the radio because, because I have firm belief that if the American pilots knew what they were bombing and knew what those bombs contain and the damage that is being done, that as human beings and as Americans, they would not bomb anymore. And I spoke in that vein. I am, uh, as, to, as to the allegations, um, I, I, I did not say what I'm accused of saying. I will be distributing the entire text of everything I said on the radio at my press conference in New York. You're saying you're denying that you said what you were reported to say. Yeah. Um, I was asked if I had seen Pham Van Dong, uh, because it's rumored that he, well, there are all kinds of rumors, I guess, that he is sick and so on and so forth. I did not meet Pham Van Dong. I said I was asked what I was going to be doing with regard to the country from which I have been divorced. And I said that I think that all of the people in the United States, and there are so many, many people, as the success of McGovern has proven, uh, the many, many people in America who are speaking out against the crimes that are being committed in our name by Nixon and by the Pentagon, the people who are struggling to, to reestablish in America the, 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 the qualities that, that we started out with, it is, it is these people who are the real patriots. I, I lived in France for seven years. And it was, it was Vietnam, and it was the war in Vietnam who forced me to ask myself certain questions about America. And I went back to the United States because I wanted to fight there in my country because I care about my country. And I think that uh, I, I shed many tears in Vietnam. I cried every day in Vietnam. It was never for the Vietnamese. It's impossible to cry for the Vietnamese. They sing, they dance, they create. Well, well, I'll talk about that in a second. I didn't cry for the Vietnamese, I cried for the Americans. Because although the bombs are falling on Vietnam, it's an, an American tragedy. The tragedy is ours. And it's going to take the American people many, many years to undo the damage and to wipe off the blight that has been put on our flag and our country by the likes of Mr. Nixon. And I, I, I believe that 
one day, and I hope it will be soon, American history will be, will be changed and will be rewritten. And I think that, uh, that all of the people who are speaking out today and the many more who will speak out tomorrow against these kind of crimes will be the real patriots, are the real patriots. You know, one of, I'll tell you a story about Vietnam. Well, you know, Curtis LeMay at one point said we should bomb Vietnam back to the Stone Age. Nixon is putting those words into reality from what I can see in North Vietnam. And while those bombs are trying to bomb Vietnam back to the Stone Age, the archaeologists are traveling, despite the danger, to the 17th parallel. And they are discovering proof of the origins of the Viet of Vietnam nation back in the Stone Age and in the Bronze Age. And they are discovering why it was that as early as three centuries before Christ, when the Chinese moved south, taking over one people after another people. They came to Vietnam, and like the Mongols after them, they had to stop because the people refused, because there was already a national identity. And the scientists and the archaeologists under the American bombs today are, are discovering proof of their national identity, of their, of their origins in the very Stone Age that Nixon is trying to bomb them back to. And what is this doing? It is giving them courage. It is inspiring them. I said, how can they do this, given the danger? And the professor said to me, but you don't understand the joy, the inspiration that comes from our, from our finding our origins. Uh, under I am going to campaign to end the war. I'm going to campaign to end the war. I would like to say one more thing. Diplomatic sources in Hanoi have reported that officials in the Nixon administration have admitted that the dikes of North Vietnam are being bombed. Well, thank you, Ms. Are there any more questions? The film is distributed by Unicité. It's been rather disturbing to many of us in Hollywood that Bob Hope and Martha Ray and companies seem to have a corner on the market of entertainers speaking to soldiers in this country and in Vietnam. And we feel that the time has come when entertainers who take a different view on the war begin to reach the soldiers, the soldiers, the forgotten soldiers, but the majority of soldiers we feel who are peace-loving and who want an end to the war. If the army is democratic and if it extends constitutional rights to its soldiers, it should uh, allow us to, to put on the kind of show that we want to put on, which is not a, um, an inflammatory far left outrageous show. It is simply a, uh, an entertaining show which is anti-war. In the 1960s, Tom Hayden stood against the establishment. He went to Hanoi and stood against American involvement in the Vietnam War, and even stood trial for conspiracy to riot. He was among the young rebels who didn't trust anyone over 30. Tonight, Jerry Bowen finds Tom Hayden well past 30 himself, and now looking for the trust of California voters. He is 42 years old now, an aspiring politician working door-to-door -door on the Los Angeles west side to win a seat in the California Assembly. But Tom Hayden is being forced by his opponent to run against his radical past, and by association, the past of his wife, Jane Fonda. The Jane Fonda who smiled with North Vietnamese anti-aircraft gunners, the Tom Hayden of the Chicago 7 and the campus anti-war rallies. We have to lay at least the temporary restraining order on these pigs across the street. The number one crime uh, on the west side is uh, obviously the crime of burglary. And the I Tom Hayden of the 1980s boasts of fighting for more police protection, of bringing rent control to Santa Monica, of being a Democrat in line with the thinking of the predominantly Democratic district. His Republican opponent, 34-year-old Bill Hawkins, is warning voters not to be fooled and hopes to spend $600,000 to hammer home his message, once a radical, always a radical. Hayden said he believes violence should never be ruled out as a method of change. As scary as that is, Tom Hayden could be in Sacramento writing our laws. 
Hayden says he's the victim of a smear campaign by a right-wing radical in moderate's clothing. He's raised $900,000 so far to get that message across, making this the most expensive legislative contest in California history. Hayden's biggest fundraiser is his wife, Jane. Arms, feet together, buttocks tight, stomach flat, shoulders down, flex hard. This week she'll raise $80,000 at invitation-only exercise clinics across the country. Money to fight the past, a part of Tom Hayden's life he regards as history. Being active over the past 20 years, including... Uh, being a radical in the 1960s, opposing the Vietnam War very, very vigorously, uh, being active in all the causes that I have been over the past 20 years, uh, I, I have become something of a, a symbol that horrifies the radical right. But Hayden's problem is not just with the radical right. There are doubters in his own party, too, as reflected by his close primary victory. And promoters of California's handgun control initiative, which Hayden supports, have asked him not to campaign actively for the issue out of fear of a voter backlash. In his own contest, Hayden expresses no concern over a voter backlash, but the election in the sprawling coastal district has become less a legislative race than a referendum on Tom Hayden's past and his future. Jerry Bowen, CBS News, Santa Monica. Playing by Senate rules, it's four strikes and you're out tonight for the conservatives. Their school prayer amendment never got past a liberal... It was canceled in New Orleans and Miami, but the Jane Fonda Road Show today was welcomed by a New England department store which showed her new collection of workout clothes. No matter the controversy over Jane Fonda's past anti-Vietnam War politics, she beguiled them in Boston. Boycott Jordan Marsh today, support the non-vets. Outside the store, Vietnam veterans Boy, protested Father, her presence and some angry customers stayed away. Somebody go tell her, peddle her stuff in Vietnam, huh? More than anything, it was Jane Fonda's trip to an anti-aircraft gun emplacement in North Vietnam that had them angry, a gun one Vietnam vet said probably used to shoot down American pilots during the Vietnam War. If her father wasn't Henry Fonda, she would have been jailed, which she should have been. In the 60s, anti-war protesters burned draft cards. Today, one Jane Fonda protester destroyed his credit card issued by the store showing her collection. Fonda discounted the protesters. And I'm going to show all those experts that said to me that you can't make a profit making clothes in this country. The profit started rolling in right away. Some older people were critical of her, but not the younger generation. It happened years and years ago. We don't have to drag on through the rest of Jane's life. So everything goes together. You know, the colors are yeah. all very bright. Yeah. The protesting so, Vietnam veterans outside um, obviously disagreed, but one paying customer said, Vietnam, that's skirt, ancient history. Said another, like I think Jane Fonda seems very closely tied to America this now. This Steve Young, CBS News, Boston. Yep. You're going to buy it? Yes, definitely. I think her stuff is super. What about the Vietnam vets outside who thought that people shouldn't uh, patronize the store, shouldn't patronize her? I think they're wrong. I think they're very wrong. Um, you have to forget, and I think they're carrying it a little too far. I don't think it's any of their business. And I don't think they have a right. I mean, they have a right to demonstrate if they want, but I don't see that what she's doing now has any effect on them at all. Tell me your name. I'm Liz Burleson. Spell it. B-U-R-L-E-S-O-N. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, I am. I'm going to wear them tonight. <laughs> uh, did you see the Vietnam vets as you came in? D did I see the what? There were Vietnam veterans in front of the store. Oh, no, I didn't. But somebody did comment about my scarf and wondered if that had something to do with politics, and it really uh, does. There, there are Vietnam veterans outside who feel that people shouldn't patronize the store today and shouldn't buy Jane Fonda's clothing because she went to North, v uh, North Vietnam during the war right. and so forth. How do you feel about that? Um, I had actually forgotten that she was coming today. Um, I guess I think she's changed since those days. Um, I guess I think buying her clothes doesn't have too much to do with her politics, as far as I'm concerned. Were you against the Vietnam War? I think it was an unnecessary war, yes. Maybe you've changed, too? As far as thinking that the war was all right? 
Hmm? Do you mean? Well, just changed in place. I mean, uh, did you take part in any protests? No, I didn't. But I guess things tend to fade with with time. Not that that makes it less important, but um, I think Jane Fonda seems very closely tied to America now with everything that she was saying today, too. So. Could you tell me your name? Pamela Sohn. Spell it. S O H N. Thank you. These are very similar. Yeah. What kind of soles do they have? The rubber sole. You tape the bottom so that. And they sell them here? Thank you. Really great. So if I wanted to do this, I would say this. clothes because she went to North Vietnam during the war, entertained uh, enemy troops. I was very young when that was all going on. I, I know Jane Fonda is an excellent actress and working out her book I have with me and I wanted her to autograph it. So I, I came to see see her and her philosophy of life about keeping fit. That That's what I'm interested in. I, I didn't, Jane Fonda and Vietnam is ancient history. That's ancient history and I don't even think about it anymore. So. Do you think the Vietnam vets are wrong in asking people not to patronize them? Um, I think everybody has the right to, you know, say whatever they want to say. So I, I just, you know, everybody has their right. Okay. Tell me your name. Is this going to be on TV? Might be. Well, I don't know if I want to tell you my name. I don't know. My husband's an attorney. I, that's why okay. I was like... In her lifetime, Jane Fonda has made a significant mark on American culture. With her movies, her workout video, her political activism, and her famous marriages, she has captured headlines in every decade for the past 40 years. She's been the envy of women seeking the perfect form and the bitter enemy of Vietnam veterans who resent her every move ever since she paraded around North Vietnam in protest of the war. Now she's written a book about all of it, and she has done an interview with us that, like the book, is sometimes painfully candid and honest. Tonight you'll hear her apologize for some of what she did in Vietnam and talk about her sometimes strange, wild, and complicated marriages. But we begin with Jane Fonda today. The workout queen at 67, grandmother of two, posing for a fashion magazine, is still glamorous and beautiful. She lives in Atlanta now and spends much of her time on a program in the schools that she began with her own money to persuade teenage girls not to get pregnant and teach the girls who are pregnant how to be better mothers. I wish that I'd been able to have a class like this when I had my first kid because I was not a good mother. And then you end up paying for it later. <laughs> she says she's drawn to this work because of the mistakes she's made in her own life and because of the mistakes her parents made raising her. If you don't have a parent or an adult, a teacher, a mentor, really see you, really love you. Yes, there are things you do I don't like, but you're fantastic. You don't, you're, you're good enough. I love you. If that never happens to a child, th the child assumes it's her fault and tries to compensate for it. And plus all the other things that happened in my life made me infected with the disease to please. Not with women, I'm fine with women, but with men. Whatever you want, honey, I'll become. And that was you. That was me. It's a story spun out in her book, which she wrote herself. She tells all about her career as an actor including her first big hit, Barefoot in the Park, with Robert Redford. Paul, if the honeymoon doesn't work out, let's not get divorced. Let's kill each other. She was big box office, made a total of 50 movies. But she says in her personal life, she had trouble standing up for herself. You know, I, I'm a very brave person. I can go to North Vietnam, I can challenge my government, but I can't challenge the man I'm with if it means I'm going to end up alone. She readily admits that she allowed each of her three husbands to reinvent her, starting with Roger Vadim, the French film director, who turned her into Barbarella, a sexy sci-fi secret agent 
with the emphasis on sexy. Could you hand me a garment? I wouldn't understand. When you look at Barbarella now, are you embarrassed by how you looked in that movie? No. No, I, I, for a long time I couldn't look at it. Why? I thought that it was politically incorrect. You know, who cares? She was a sex symbol. She yes. was a pin-up symbol. Yeah. Can't get away from it. Yeah. But I can look at it now and laugh at it and find it very charming. She's come to see Vadim's Barbarella with a sense of humor, but her off-screen private life with him is another matter. One night, Vadim brought another woman into my bed with me, and I went along with it. It, it, it reinforced my feeling that I wasn't good enough. And the, one of the reasons that I went along with it was because I felt that if I said no, that he would leave. And I couldn't imagine myself without him. Well, you know, you admit that you didn't just give in. You went out and solicited the women sometimes. Sometimes. That's right. That's, that's right. Hey, if that's what he wanted, I'd give it to him in, in spades. I wasn't going to write about it. I got enough enemies, right? <laughs> There's enough people who don't like me. I'm not going well, to go into this. But why? why? I, that, that's my big question. Why? You didn't have to write about this. We'd never know. This would have just been your life buried away. Yeah. Why are you telling us this? Because I knew that if I didn't really fess up about how far I went in the betrayal of my heart, that it, w it would not make the journey that I've been on to where I'm now as important and as poignant. Her marriage with Vadim ended. One, two, three, four, we don't want your fucking war. And she threw herself into political activism. I'm charging the government with genocide, with genocide, and, and, and ecticide and biocide. You say yourself in the book that when you see video of you back then, I mean, you win. We have no right to bomb military targets in Vietnam. We have no right to attack that country. You said, watching myself, I want to shout, will someone please tell her to shut up? Yes. <laughs> you say of yourself. Right. I just couldn't stop. <laughs> I just kept going, and I, I was probably shrill. That's when she met a star of the anti-Vietnam War movement, Tom Hayden, and married him. And when she did, she lurched into his very different lifestyle. Jane Fonda, Hollywood star, moves into this little tiny house. Your father called it the shack. You didn't have a washing machine. Jane Fonda schlepping the clothes to a laundromat. You. Yeah. And it was a period of time when, you know, you, you uh, um, you showed your political purity by living, you know, in a way that made my teeth great, to tell you the truth. It was hard. <laughs> it was hard. I mean, if I put a, a, a picture up on the wall of my bedroom, the, the nail would come through the other side. You were making good money, and you're living like that. We were giving the money away. We had to support an anti-war movement. The money you were making on movies? Pretty much, yeah. Yeah. Why spend it on yourself when people are dying and there's a war going on? It was a crisis. Some of the money went to their travels across the country protesting the war and meeting with Vietnam veterans and to pay for Jane's trip to Hanoi, the enemy capital, in 1972. She earned the epithet Hanoi Jane and the eternal hatred of many veterans when she visited an anti-aircraft gun site used to shoot down American pilots. That picture mm -hmm. said in so many words, I'm Jane Fonda and I'm siding with the enemy of, of the American soldiers. I know, and it just, I will go to my grave regretting that. The image of Jane Fonda, Barbarella, Henry Fonda's daughter, mm. just a woman sitting on an enemy aircraft gun was a betrayal. It was like I was thumbing my nose at the military and at, at the country that gave me privilege. It was the largest lapse of judgment that I can even imagine. I don't thumb my nose at this country. I care deeply 
about American soldiers. But many of those soldiers say if there's one thing they will never forgive her for, it's that she met with a group of seven POWs when she was in North Vietnam, giving the appearance of a staged event at their expense. Was that a lapse of judgment? No. I, there are hundreds of American delegations had met with POWs. It was not uncommon at all. But that, does that make it right? It doesn't make it wrong. But the Vietnamese used it as propaganda to say, look how humane we are. Well, you know, both sides were using propaganda, you know, were using the POWs for propaganda. Um, I, you know, I don't think there was anything wrong with it. It's not something that I, that I will apologize for. Nor does she apologize for making broadcasts on Radio Hanoi. Our government was lying to us, and men were dying because of it. And I felt that I had to do anything that I could to expose the lies and help end the war. That was my goal. It was she who asked the Vietnamese if she could make the broadcasts, tapes of which we found at the National Archives in Washington. This is Jane Fonda in Hanoi, and I'm, I'm speaking to the men in the Catholics of the Academy, in the Duke of the Queen. She went on Radio Hanoi at least 10 times, speaking directly to U.S. pilots, after she had toured the bombed-out countryside and visited hospitals full of injured civilians. We must stop dropping these bombs on the people of Vietnam. Were you trying to get the soldiers to stop the bombing? In other words, disobey their orders? No, I, I, I knew that you cannot ask a soldier to disobey orders. You're not the one that pays the consequences. Well, you said, uh, th this is direct quotes, I beg you to consider what you are doing. The hospitals are filled with babies and women and old people. Can you justify what you are doing? Mm -hmm. Doesn't that sound like you're asking them to stop what they're doing? I'm asking them to consider it. I'm asking them to think about it. But the soldiers who call you Hanoi Jane and are still furious at you say it's one thing to protest here in, in the country and another thing to go over there where our soldiers were, mm -hmm. you know, in harm's way, mm -hmm. and go into the enemy camp. Mm -hmm. I mean, it wasn't like you were saying, Richard Nixon, stop this. No, of talking, course not. No, you were saying to the pilots. Listen, we'd been saying to Richard Nixon, stop this, for eight years. Millions of people had protested. You know, uh, students had been shot at Kent State, and still it went on. It needed what looks now to be unbelievably controversial things. That's what I felt was needed. But when you hear of this intense fury at you, how many years later, 30, 30 years later, does it, does it hurt you? It makes me sad. It makes me sad because I, I think that it's ill-placed anger. It, it, I, I understand that I'm a lightning rod, and I know why the anger is there. What if a young, famous actress mm -hmm. went to Iraq, hooked up with the insurgents today, and went on their radio and spoke to our soldiers over there today? I don't, I don't, I, I wouldn't like it. I, it. I don't think it's the same situation at all. When, when I went there, we had been involved in the war. We had been fighting in Vietnam for eight years. The majority of Americans opposed the war. The majority of Congress opposed the war. It was a desperate time. Time magazine has an excerpt of Jane's book starting tomorrow, and the book itself goes on sale Tuesday. After we ran the first part of our story on Jane Fonda last week, it was cut short by our coverage of the Pope's death, we got more mail than usual, most of it angry at her. She still stirs that kind of emotion for her trip to Hanoi during the Vietnam War. While she defended most of what she did on that trip, she apologized in our broadcast for one thing. She told us she regrets this posing at an anti-aircraft gun the North Vietnamese used to shoot down American pilots. Here's what she said. I will go to my grave 
regretting that. The image of Jane Fonda, Barbarella, Henry Fonda's daughter, mm. just a woman sitting on an enemy aircraft gun was a betrayal. It was like I was thumbing my nose at the military and at, at the country that gave me privilege. It was the largest lapse of judgment that I can even imagine. I don't thumb my nose at this country. I care deeply about American soldiers. In her new book and in our interview tonight, Jane Fonda acknowledges that while she could be outspoken on the public stage, as she was over Vietnam, she was close to timid with her husbands, first with Roger Vadim, the French film director, then with Tom Hayden, the political activist. She lived the way he wanted to in a dingy little house her father called the shack. But if she failed in her personal relationships, her professional life has been a dazzling string of successes, one after another. In 1979, she started The Workout that eventually sold something like 17 million copies. Woo! Are you ready? This is it. The ultimate workout. She used the proceeds from the workout, she says, to fund the various causes she and Tom Hayden supported. In fact, for many years, she didn't even own the business. Their political organization did. We structured it that way, so all the money from the workout went in to the organization. I think $17 million. And how did Tom react to the workout? He hated it. He hated the workout. He thought it was all about vanity. And so even though, you know, it put a lot of money into our political work, it, f it felt like a wedge for him between the two of us. On her 51st birthday, Hayden told her he had fallen in love with someone else. And my life collapsed. I never you thought I was... You had a nervous breakdown. I did. That's I, the way it read. Yeah. I couldn't speak above a whisper. I couldn't walk fast. I felt it's like blood physical. was coming through my skin. It, I felt like I'd just found out I'd been adopted. After yeah. 17 years of marriage and having a child together, they divorced. On the day after it was announced in the papers, Ted Turner called from out of the blue. The phone rings and it's this booming southern accent <laughs> and the first words out of his mouth were, is it true? <laughs> is what true? I said, thinking this was really a weird way to start a conversation. Yeah. Um, and he said, are you and Hayden getting a divorce? Now, me and I'm, I'm in the middle of a nervous breakdown, right? I can't talk above a whisper. And I she said, wasn't yeah. ready. Said, but when he it called back three happened? months later, the, you know, he put on the charm. Tough. I mean, he went after me and dropped on his knees, recited poetry that he'd written in high school. I mean, it was irresistible. And then he would come out with something like, the only problem is you're too old. <laughs> How do you go from Tom Hayden living in the shack and turn around and marry a billionaire with, I don't, you talk about how many houses he has. I can't even remember how many. How many well, ranches, how many homes, how 23. many? 23. 23. I, when I married but him. how do you go from one to the other without, again, completely losing yourself somewhere in there? You can get used to being taken care of very fast. You can get used to a billionaire like that. I mean, it doesn't take much. I'll man. bet. <laughs> you know. But, you know, I look from the outside at this marriage and I say, Jane Fonda did it again. She allowed a man to change her. In a positive way, yeah. I mean, I know it, it, I'm a chameleon in some ways. I mean, you know, I became, I was going to all these receptions. I mean, he goes from one thing to another, a lot of tuxedos, a lot of gowns, on the arm of corporate executive. What was really going on, though, was very, very different. What was going on was he gave me confidence. Ted Turner would wake up every morning and say, I love you so much. You are so beautiful. And I would think, well, he's no dummy. <laughs> Better she whiz. <laughs> and yet, he wanted her to give up her movie career, which she did, she says, happily. But generally, she was subsumed, as she had been with Vadim and Hayden, into her husband's life. And now she blames that disease to please, as she puts it, on a difficult childhood. First off, her mother committed suicide. Jane was 12. She had been institutionalized, and the last time she came home with a nurse, the nurse was there to keep her from doing this, but she got away from the nurse and went up and 
got a little lacquer box that had a razor in it, and and then and she she went back to the institution and, and cut her throat. But when she died, they didn't tell you that it was no. suicide. No, they said she had a heart attack, and, and <laughs> one day someone passed me a a movie magazine with a story about my dad, and and it said, and his wife Frances Seymour Fonda cut her throat in a, and I knew it was true. I knew it was true. That's how you found out? You mm -hmm. read it in a movie magazine? Mm -hmm. Her father never spoke to her about the death. She writes that Henry Fonda, so beloved as an actor, was a man of dark moods and rages at home, and that she spent much of her life trying to reach him, Good even job. producing the movie on Golden Pond explicitly so he could win his first Oscar. I think that, um... Maybe you and I should have the kind of relationship that we're supposed to have. What kind of relationship is that? Well, you know, like a, like a father and a daughter. Their relationship the time, in the movie, she writes, was close anything. to the real one. It just, it seems that you and me have been mad at each other for so long. I didn't think we were mad at that. We just didn't like each other. She says that Henry Fonda was as cold to her through the making of the movie as he had been when she was a little girl. At the age of 15, she developed bulimia, sometimes binging and purging up to eight or nine times a day. This went on into her 40s. Yes, and my husbands never knew, and my children never knew. It's a, it's a, it's a disease of denial. She was into denial about a lot of things, until six years into her marriage with Ted Turner when she was 60. She felt something was missing and turned to Christianity, even though Turner had called it, quote, a religion for losers, for which he apologized. I had become a Christian and I had not told him. Is that one of the reasons the marriage broke? It's part of it, yeah. But why didn't you tell him? I, I find that a little astonishing. You're it married is. and- It's not and... fair. It's not, wasn't fair at all. What it was, Leslie, it was I was yearning for the spiritual that I had not had. And I knew that if I told him or asked him before I did it, that he would talk me out of it. So they split. But she decided to stay in Atlanta, where she lives alone in a spacious loft decorated with Andy Warhol's portraits of her. She told us she continues to see Ted Turner, whom she calls her favorite ex-husband. You get together. We do. <laughs> we do, yes. But no, we don't. We're not public, not most of the time anyway. But no, but we see each other. He comes to my ranch and goes fishing, and occasionally I'll have dinner with his main girlfriend. <laughs> oh, it's so complicated. <laughs> complicated doesn't begin to describe it. They recently went on a cruise together. And did she just say she has dinner with his girlfriend? When you have real closure in terms of do I want to be married anymore? And you know that you don't. But your DNA is saturated with him because you care so much about his well-being. Then why not embrace the girlfriend? Listen to what the girlfriend before Jane did. She gave me a little booklet called User's Manual. <laughs> with him. all the tips about how to handle him. Isn't that great? I'm bowled over. <laughs> I am bowled over. And now that's, in effect, what you're doing with his new girlfriend. Yeah, yeah. With his girlfriends. Kevin! Uh, Pleasure to meet you. Last year, Jane unretired from Hollywood to make her first movie in 15 years, Monster-in-Law, that hits theaters next month. Parker? Action! Making the movie also gave her a chance to spend time with Troy Garrity, her son with Tom Hayden, who followed her into acting. Part of her new life is an effort to make up for her having been an inattentive mother, especially with her firstborn, Vanessa Vadim, whom she says she neglected as a child. I didn't show up for her. I didn't really, I was away a lot. And, and it's one of the great regrets of my life. She and I are still working on it, you know, we're... we're... Has she forgiven you? I don't you know. You don't know? No, I don't know. Where, where would it go? She where also it spends time book? with her daughter, Lulu, whom Jane and Tom Hayden raised. Lulu disagrees that she wasn't a good mother. She was an incredible mother to me, a life-saving, I mean, the, 
the only mother I had from a very small age, but... Well, but I was older. Yeah. I was older. I was starting to, to, find, to find myself. It's a process she's still working on as she moves through what she calls the third act of her life. So you're 67. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about getting older? It's not easy. I feel like a jalopy. I'm losing fenders and hubcaps. <laughs> Oh. I've got arthritis. Ted called the other day and said, if you were a horse, we'd trade you in. <laughs> but no one's putting this woman out to pasture. Without a man for the first time in her life, really, she says she has never been happier. Do you think you'll get married again? I have no idea. I'm so, I have learned never to say I'm never going to do it again. That's what I said about movies. It's, no, I have no You're idea. You're not going there. But like I said, if I do, it won't be such a long haul. <laughs>